Well, hello. Hey, everybody. Coach Jay here with... Hey, everybody. I'm Coach Jay, and we are back to Kickstarter Live. Usually when you see me here, I'm talking all about Coach Jay's Chess Academy and all the great things that it can do for you and your students. Now, uh, also in the news is um, Blade Runner. And Blade Runner 2049 is out in the movie theaters now. Can't wait to check it out. But this is from the original Blade Runner with Rucker Hauer. And in that movie, he had to get up to see the creator, the guy that, that made all the, the androids, all the replicants. And in order to do that, he met with one of the engineers and that engineer had a game going, a chess game going. And he said, show me the position. And so uh, he shows them the position and he says, okay, I've got a plan. And so then they, they go to the guy's house and they ring the bell and, and he says, um, you know, what's up? And he says, um, he goes, I, I, I have a move for our chess game. And so that move was from um, the game I'm going to show you right now, which was Adolf Anderson against Kizaritsky from 1851. Now, this tournament was really cool. I mentioned it when we talked about the history of chess, but to me it was um, a really cool tournament because it was players from all these different countries coming together for the very first time, and nobody had a rating, and so nobody really knew who was going to win. And Howard Staunton was favored, but... He was an organizer of it, so it's always tough to be the organizer and at the same time also, you know, give your very best effort in all the games, be able to focus like that. Um, so he got knocked out early, and Adolf Anderson did go on to win that first ever international chess tournament in 1851, which was held in conjunction with the Great Exhibition in London. They were showing off all their, um, their engineering and science uh, creations in London, and so um, the chess tournament was something that went – right side by side with that. In any case, um, Anderson was a great player. He's one of the top three players in the world for like 40 years um, in the 1800s. And not many players can claim that they were one of the top players in the world for 40 years. Although Vichy and Nan's getting pretty close. I, I'm just kidding, Vichy. Um, he's not that old. In any case, um, well, let's have a look at the game. This game uh, was Anderson Kizaritsky played in 1851. And Anderson's white and he plays the king's gambit. So e4, e5, and throws up that f pawn. And you're probably checking out this chessboard and saying, is that a wooden board or is it a roll up board? Well, it is a wood grain uh, chessboard and actually uh, was given to me by my friend Shelby Lorman. Uh, Shelby runs American Chess Equipment. So if you want a mouse pad uh, wood grain chessboard, you'll have to. Check with American chess equipment. In any case, um, after this, uh, Kizaritsky captures the pawn. So King's Gambit accepted, we'd say. And the usual move is now knight f3 to guard this critical h4 square. But Anderson threw caution to the wind and played bishop to c4, aiming towards the weakest pawn on the board, the f pawn. The king's bishop pawn, also you know the f pawn, is the weakest pawn because at the start of the game, only the king protects it. So it's a nice target to aim towards. And not being able to resist the check, Kizaritsky comes out. Now, g3 is not a good option because after the pawn captures, if the h pawn takes back, it opens up this attack along the h file. So the h pawn is pinned by the queen. And if pawn takes, queen can take the rook. If the knight comes out to attack the queen, then this surprising move would work very well. This discovered check, pushing the pawn up, the knight captures the queen to get rid of the check, but then the, here comes the check right back. When the pawn takes, the new queen, now back on the board, um, very quickly promoting and getting a rook also, a little bonus piece. So for that reason, that was an, not a good option. And Anderson knew that ahead of time. He had played this line before, and he plays king f1. So now he can't castle. But his opponent has the queen out too early. So, you know, uh, whose advantage is it? It's a, it's a little bit of both. It's an, it's an interesting game. In any case, after the king moves out, he's a risky play to move that was popular back in those days um, that you wouldn't see played by masters today. Pawn to b5 to draw the bishop away from attacking the weak f pawn and also to give him a chance to pick up a tempo against the bishop with c6, which we're going to see later on. And after the bishop took a b5, 
Now he brings his knight out and attacks the pawn. The problem with this knight coming out, it blocks the queen's retreat. And she's going to be stuck on the side of the board. Don't forget, when somebody attacks one of your pieces, look at all your... And one of them that you'll see in the later, the higher levels of Coach Chase Chess Academy is the eight options when you're under attack. And one of those options that's used pretty, pretty often with great effect is to attack a piece of equal or greater value. So Anderson plays knight f3, attacking the queen, instead of worrying about the pawn, and the queen runs back to h6. And now he pushes his pawn up, makes a pawn chain, and also protects his pawn and pins the pawn that's on f4. When Kieseritsky plays knight h5, he breaks two opening guidelines. And one of those is don't move the same piece twice in the opening. The other one is don't move your knights to the side of the board. That doesn't mean that you should ignore them, laugh at them, and then keep developing pieces without actually paying attention to what they're up to, because a lot of times they do it because they have a premature threat. They're threatening something that you can easily defend against, and such is the case here. The threat is actually a pretty good one. Uh, I mean, as far as a damaging one, knight to g3, forking the king and the rook and taking advantage of the pen on the h file. And so the if the pawn takes, the queen can take the rook check. And so he does have a plan. One of the things I've learned over the years is that when somebody breaks an opening guideline, a lot of times you need to break one back in order to take advantage of it. And so Anderson plays knight to h4, but his knight has better prospects because the knight on h5 can't jump into the f4 square, but this knight can jump into a close square. And so he plays out here. Now, knight g3 would be countered by the simple capture, and nothing's happening on the h file. He's just lost his knight. So he plays here. Kizaritsky forks the knight and the bishop with his queen. And another thing we see in Coach Jay's Chess Academy in the defense section, once again, that's a section you're not going to find in, in, um, in any other books out there. But this in this defense section, we talk about dealing with forks, different strategies that you can use to deal with a fork. And one of them is to move the piece and block the line of attack to the other piece. And that's what happens here. He plays knight to f5 and blocks him off. All right, so now things are going to get a little bit exciting. So hang on for the ride. Pawn to c6, attacking the bishop. And once again, instead of moving the bishop, he plays a counterattack and plays pawn to g4. He pushes up the pawn, attacking the knight here. And I want to point out something very quickly, that this pawn on f4, waiting for this guy to move, but and when he goes up two, he could still capture him en passant. He could capture just like that. Not a good idea right now because the bishop would take the queen, but I did want to point that out. And so Kizaritsky looks at him and says, okay, I could take your bishop and let you take my knight, but instead I'm simply going to move my knight back. Now I'm still attacking your bishop, and I'm double attacking your pawn. I have my knight and my queen both attacking it. And everybody watching the game is like, oh, well, obviously Anderson's going to save his bishop and just lose a pawn, and he's probably going to be in a little bit of trouble. Well, he didn't. He played rook g1 and saved the pawn because this pawn is a critical part of his plan. And the bishop, well, it's a distraction over here for right now. And after pawn takes bishop, Anderson plays pawn h4, attacking the queen, driving her back. Pawn h5, pushing her, the queen right back to her only safe square, which is g5. And now Anderson would love to take here. Bishop takes f4, and the queen would be trapped, except that the queen could take the bishop. So he decides he needs to support that square with another piece, and he brings the queen out. And this does two things. Besides threatening bishop takes f4, it also has an x-ray attack towards this rook in the corner, the only thing in the way being this pawn. So the two threats that Anderson has are bishop takes f4, trapping the queen, and pawn to e5, attacking the knight, and suddenly opening a discovered attack onto the rook in the corner. Kizaritsky found the only move to save himself from both threats, and it's an ugly one, knight to g8. After four moves, one, two, three, four, the knight is right back where he started. And Anderson, in the meantime, is developing a lot of pieces. So what is it worth to give away a piece? He's 
At this point, Anderson has sacrificed his bishop for a pawn, but in return, he has a centralized knight, he has a lot of space, his pawns have pushed up in a controlled manner, controlling squares, and he has his queen in the strong square behind the pawns, the bishop is, has a lot of scope, and the rook's actually in the game as well. So it seems like he has enough compensation, we say, for the sacrifice piece. And so he pushes the queen back, Kizaritsky does, and we see here an opportunity for Anderson to push the pawn to e5 and attack the rook, but it's not a well thought out plan. It's, it's a little bit of hope chess. Uh, hope chess is when you play a, a bad move, hoping your opponent plays a worse one. So this would attack the queen and attack the rook, hoping that they would miss their, their one move, but it's a good one. And queen c6 would save the queen and the rook, and now white's just wasted a move that doesn't really help. So it's often a good idea if you don't have a plan that works to just keep developing pieces, to keep strengthening your position, uh, push your pieces forward and, and make things better, one, one move at a time. So he develops a knight and plays knight c6. And after the bishop comes out to or knight c3, after bishop to c5 attacking the rook, Anderson once again thinks about all of his options when he's under attack and plays knight b5, attacking a piece of greater value than his rook. Well, crunch. The queen goes flying in here, uh, takes b2, and so this queen has now moved a bunch of times. I mean, she had to move to get out of that attack. And Anderson finds a move that when I plugged it into my computer a few years ago before computers became so powerful, it took my computer three and a half minutes to find this move, to realize it was the best move. Anderson plays bishop to d6, leaving both rooks hanging under attack. And the idea is he's starting to really put this king in a mating net. If the bishop takes, the knight can take back, and there's going to be a mate in just a few moves after a knight takes and back. So instead, Kizaritsky captured the rook on g1. Some books, by the way, will have the reverse order on these two moves, the queen capturing on a1 um, instead of the, the bishop taking here. I can't say that I know for sure which one uh, is the right order because I wasn't there in 1851. But this is the one that I've seen more often, is bishop takes g1 first. And now... Anderson wants to take at g7, but the queen from all the way at b2 can come across. So he blocks off the queen, plays pawn to e5, and Kizaritsky captures here. Check. And the king moves up, and the novice chess player would now walk by the chessboard and see what's been captured without really looking at the board, and they would say, wow, that Anderson is a horrible player because he's captured two pawns, and Black has captured two rooks, a bishop, and two pawns. But as you probably know by now, it's not all about material. And in this position, he says, okay, um, I'm going to cause some trouble for you. And wow, what did I do? I missed him. Did I miss a move, Coach Cow? Okay. So, oh no, he plays here. Sorry. He pushed up. And so now it's Kizaritsky's turn. Kizaritsky guards against this mate because what he sees coming is knight takes g7, king over, and then bishop c7 mate. So he plays knight a6, and black has three pieces in the action, a knight on the side, a queen in the corner, and a bishop against the side over here. And so that can't be good, and Anderson makes him pay for it. He takes here, sure enough, check. And when the king comes over, now we get to... This position from the movie Blade Runner, the original. And so um, here, Rucker Howard says, tell him, queen to bishop six, check. And of course, the creator, you know, says over the intercom, he says, oh, what are you doing? You know, what, what is this crazy move you're doing? And so the idea is that he wants to play the checkmate at e7, but the knight on g8 protects against it. So Anderson after giving away two rooks and a bishop, sacrifices his queen, check, to lure the knight to f6, and now bishop to e7, checkmate. There it is, the immortal game, as we call it, Anderson against Kizaritsky, 1851. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy Blade Runner 2049.